So we're back to this farce. Last time we saw the conclusion of Teresa's idiotic plan up through chapter 13, which is about halfway through the book, which is actually rather convenient because the, the halfway point of the book is where it kind of shifts how it tells the story. The first half, you can say, is kind of a self-contained story in and of itself, and the second half is a series of semi-related vignettes. So while the rest of the book does feel like it takes place in the same universe with the same characters, characters, the plot kind of takes a sharp turn away from any continual narrative. And the point of the rest of the book is, look at how great Teresa is through all these different misadventures. Really, if Norman wanted to do himself a favor, he would have cut off the last couple of pages of the last chapter so Teresa didn't tilt the planet and doom everybody. Well, I mean, I guess they were all kind of doomed already because she did not restart the wind. And now the North Pole is forever exploding. So those are really the only parts you really need to remember. The Earth is tilted slightly and the North Pole looks... Well, you don't need to know that the North Pole is exploding, but it is. Moving onwards, we pick up immediately where chapter 13 left off and Teresa and the Parkers and the Prime Minister and Steve are all celebrating together. And the whole world is celebrating along with her because we get this scene from China. It was estimated that 25 million people were gathered there, making it the largest crowd in history. The sound of their voices was one continuous, unwavering roar. They were holding my photograph in their hands and yelling, Ta Yi Sa, Ta Yi Sa. I'm not sure if that's racist, but that's probably racist. That is not the only time I will be saying that during this review. We also get to see how humble and generous Teresa is in her ass pull of a victory. The reporters talked excitedly about how I had saved seven billion lives. There wouldn't even be a famine in Asia. I was the biggest hero in history. Steve was so proud of me that he almost popped the buttons off his shirt. What, is Steve hulking out or something? That immense crowd in Beijing was not even 1% of the people I had saved. If there was justice, what would my reward be? There are a lot of things that writers can do to better their craft, to further understand how to write, how to set up characters. One of the better ways that I don't see a lot of people talking about is studying psychology. Now, you don't need to become like a master level psychologist or anything like that, but to have at least a basic understanding of how people think, how people process, how people generally react in certain scenarios, I think is good to know. If you want to take a full course, I recommend you check out the Psychology Workbook for Writers by Darian Smith. There are a lot of basic plot points, a lot of basic questions for you to consider when constructing characters and a workbook in place. It really does a lot to really get you into your character's shoes and to think about how they would think. It's really a good resource. And the reason I bring this up is because of one of my favorite subjects when I was taking psychology, and that is the work of a man named Lawrence Kohlberg. Lawrence Kohlberg came up with uh, the six stages of moral development. And while not a universal truth, it does give the framework for understanding someone's moral development or where they are as far as a moral compass is concerned. What Teresa just demonstrated in the two passages I just read indicates that she has very stunted moral growth. If there's any justice, what will my reward be? Terrible moral implication for her character. First off, she and Hal were the cause of the wind stopping in the first place, so this is really her fixing her own mistake and expecting a reward for it. Second, Teresa is not an altruist. She didn't help people because it was the right thing, she did it because she wanted something out of it. According to Kohlberg's stages of moral development, she is on the second of six steps of moral development. She is on the stage normally meant for children, the what's in it for me stage. And reading from the Wikipedia page, Stage two reasoning shows a limited interest in the needs of others, but only to a point where it might further the individual's own interests. So I think that defines Teresa pretty well. Great job, Norman. Your main character is a selfish bitch. So this worldwide celebration, knowing that they're not all going to die, despite the fact that no one had really shown any signs of worry beforehand, 
Uh, people struggle to outdo each other in praising Teresa, and despite apparently being hidden away from the world to save her from assassins, uh, there were a hundred thousand cars trying to get to Teresa's location. And so, in order to avoid the population, because the security personnel of a few thousand soldiers can't stop them or set up any kind of a blockade, Teresa is going to go to London, one of the most heavily populated cities on the planet, in order to avoid the crowds. Brilliant! But while visiting London, Teresa goes to see Prime Minister Blair and expresses concern because apparently she didn't want to become famous. Norman, does the term false humility mean anything to you? I do not know what that means. So Blair sets up an audience for Teresa with the House of Commons. And I can understand Teresa not being a great public speaker. That's fine, frankly. It's a good idea because she doesn't really have a lot of demonstrated experience doing that. Norman did not choose to express that well. I'm not a public speaker. I never wanted to be. I'm talking to the media and the people on the street. Excuse this little piece of paper. It reminds me of the points I've been thinking of a long time. You know, you could have just said, excuse this cue card. She makes an appeal for people to just leave her alone because she doesn't really want this newfound celebrity status all of a sudden. I mean, Teresa, this is part of your reward. International fame and adoration. Don't you want it? Everybody you see on television is there because they want it to be. Yeah, I don't think that's really true in some cases, like a uh, renowned piece of shit Harvey Weinstein. He's been getting a lot of bad press coverage recently. I'm not sure he's crazy about it. But early in Teresa's speech, somebody from the House of Commons, I suppose, interrupts Teresa, and a lot of that false humility just strikes out again. And she says this, How dare he interrupt me? In answer to his own question, why had he spoken if not to attract attention to himself? This hypocrisy had become plain to everyone as I stared his political career into oblivion. You interrupted me, I said. Nobody interrupts me. I don't need you. You could almost see the miserable man's political career melting down to his feet. He had dared to interrupt the world's saver. There would be rioting in his hometown. Jesus Christ, Teresa! The man just asked you a question. I mean, yeah, it was a dumb one, but you're ruining his political career over that? While at the same time pleading to be left alone? You know, Norman didn't actually give any chapter titles. They're all just listed numerically, but this one could definitely be called Teresa the Hypocrite. A chill was felt around the room. The old rules were out. There was a new sheriff in town. Teresa shows absolutely no qualms about pushing people around at her will. So really, she wants all the fame and notoriety that saving the world brings, but none of the hardships or responsibility. And of course, everybody cheers. And we get a full page of Teresa ranting about reporters. Again, take a shot. I won't answer reporters' questions. Nobody elected you. Weren't you just saying you were the new sheriff in town? Nobody elected you, Teresa. What the hell? Neither the house members nor any of the millions watching could believe it. They had never heard of any person with any kind of achievement, no matter how small, not seeking some kind of recognition for it. Okay, Norman does not know what altruism is. I'm, I'm calling it. It's, everyone's out for something in Norman's world. Charity is not real, it's just a tax write-off. Hello, you. What? Stop being adorable, you're distracting me. So the entire section is just Teresa complaining about wanting everything and nothing. There are a lot of mixed signals in this section. So Teresa decides to go back to, you know, luxury as it was. Uh, all the food that had been, had not been grown in the time of, you know, no wind or rain or anything, uh, completely okay. I guess all the stores of food were enough to replenish the food that had not been grown, because that's totally how that works. Uh, there were no shortages anywhere, there was no minimization of global trade or anything. But out of nowhere, Steve asks what happened to Jan Struthers, you know, the woman who was with the DIA and who was helping Teresa earlier. A fair question, considering that Jan disappeared about 150 pages ago. So Teresa puts out 
a an international notice saying that she's looking for Jan. And this is broadcast on Channel 24, the All Teresa All the Time station. Because that's a thing. But remember, she doesn't want to be famous. She wants to be left alone. How many contradictions have we had in this one chapter? Mm. We get Jan's story as told from Teresa's perspective, as if Teresa was there next to her, and the entire thing, this is still first person perspective, mind you. This entire section is about Jan, and yet we get sentences like, Jan gambled that if I was arrested or disappeared, the Canadian Prime Minister would make a big stink about it. There are so many fundamental rules being broken. So many writing conventions that are just thrown out into this book. I honestly don't know how I finished this. But Jan has not been doing too well. Jan Struthers had not had a good summer. Her eight years of managing my watchers did nothing for her. She couldn't tell anybody about it. Nobody would believe her. That left an eight year hole in her resume. Now in her thirties, her college education wasted, unemployable, unmarried, and living with her aging parents, her life was a ruin. If that is all true, then Jan is an idiot. Jan reported to someone who knew what she was doing, which meant that everything she did would have been on some kind of record somewhere. For her not to be able to go anywhere means that she is a massive fuck up. Also, did she get fired or something? How come she's no longer employed with the DIA? How is she unemployable because there's an eight year hole in her resume? No, she states, I worked with the DIA. And if anyone asks, about any secret information, she just says, I can't talk about that, you know better. She ran a department with a staff of more than 400 people. She should be very employable, especially with how young she apparently is. But Jan gets the message and decides to go work for Teresa in the dumbest way possible. But more on that later. Chapter 15, we start off with a section about what happened to President Martin. And this is the last time he ever shows up in the book. And it just comes down to he was doing okay. Wasn't he the bad guy? Why is this a satisfying conclusion? And why did we need to know about this for the advancement of the plot if he never comes up again and there's no impact on Teresa or anything else? So Teresa and Steve are just enjoying life and sitting down to breakfast when the Prime Minister comes by for a visit. And he has dire news. A group of oceanographers have informed me that the oceans will rise due to thermal expansion. They believe it is already up a sixteenth of an inch. They say it will rise two or three feet in a year. What's causing it? asks Steve. It is the reduction of the Earth's declination. Normally water is heated in the summer months and cooled in the winter to maintain a constant average temperature. With the reduction in declination, this process is frustrated. The oceans are not losing their heat normally. Sunlight is coming into the northern hemisphere at a more vertical angle than normal for this time of year. And he goes on to over explain the whole situation. Parts of the ocean are three miles deep. Three feet is only two hundredths of one percent. Recall that the water on the ocean floor has been around zero degrees Fahrenheit because of winter cooling. Now it will climb up to 10 or 15 degrees. That's a huge difference. So good job, Teresa. You imbecile, you've doomed us all. Apologies. Teresa's idiotic plan is confirmed climate change. Here's the thing though. If the water on the bottom of the ocean is heating up to 10 or 15 degrees. The rest of the planet's already fucked. I'm on fire! The problem now is the Earth is heating up and will cause global flooding because all the ice is melting. So what do you think Teresa's plan will be? I want you to guess. Pause the video and go to the comments section and type out what you think will happen from this multiple choice selection. Is Teresa going to A. Chuck a bunch of water out into space B. Bring in some of the coldness of space and use that to chill the planet C. Return to the Earth to its proper axis or D. Just find another planet to live on For those of you who guessed A, congratulations! Teresa's solution would not be out of place in an episode of Futurama. Steve does some math and 
comes back later on and says, you need to get rid of one cubic mile of water every three minutes for a year. <laughs> So one cubic mile of water every three minutes. Uh, there are uh, that that means it'll happen about 20 times every hour, 24 hours in a day. So we're talking 480 cubic miles of water removed from the planet every day. You multiply that by 365, and you get 175,200 square miles of water removed from the planet. And they only need to do that for a year, so I guess the problem is just gonna run out? Like, is the sun gonna stop heating up the planet? Cause that's not how that works. And keep in mind, that's in addition to the insane amount of water that's already been released to the North Pole ice columns. So if this gets any worse, you're gonna be able to walk from Boston to London. So Teresa comes up with a plan to remove the water and apparently it takes eight days to finish the program. I, okay. Hal lifted a cubic mile of water out of the South Pacific, a few hundred miles from Antarctica on the Pacific side. It rose at 40 miles an hour, bringing it completely out of the ocean surface in one and a half minutes. And if you thought that this was a temporary solution, like maybe the water will just get shot out into space and come back later on, nope, it's gone for good. Powerful radar systems monitored their rise. In one day, they were well above Earth's orbit. They would never return. Where will they go? A science consultant was asked on television. They will go into orbit around the sun well outside the Earth's orbit. You know, I really feel sorry for all the fish and, and divers and boats that got caught in the way. How many animals died to make this work? But that solution was easy enough and we never bring it up again. And if you've been paying attention, you know Teresa's routine. She did a smidge of work, so now she deserves a vacation. You remember how, you know, the North Pole is exploding and creating a bunch of mist to bother people uh, at all times of the day. Well, Teresa decides that walking around with umbrellas all the time would not do. Even though I don't see why that wouldn't work. I guess it's supposed to be because millions of other people would be doing it, so it'd be like crowded and would take up space. I think that's what's being implied. Their solution is hilarious. Steve found an American fireman's apparel website. They sold authentic American fireman's helmets. These helmets had brims all around that caught water and guided it in back of your head to fall on the ground. No more perfect headgear had ever been designed to keep your head dry. <laughs> you know, I'm almost disappointed Teresa didn't go with those stupid umbrella hats that they've made. They also get to pick the shields, and Teresa goes with a uh, New York shield in honor of the firefighters who died on 9-11. So, uh, confirmed this does not take place in the 90s or anything like that. And actually keep that in mind because that is going to, not 9-11, not but the, the time frame is gonna come up later. They also go with these face protectors that were apparently something like what football players got. And somehow she goes and she makes the people of England look like country bumpkins. The first day of our England tour, we wore the helmets. They were a smash hit. The English people had never seen them in real life and oohed and odd. God, okay, I'm, I'm actually gonna look this up. Okay, so apparently British firefighter helmets look more like motorcycle helmets than ours, I guess. Actually, I kind of prefer the English ones. They look a little more practical. Like, I, I'd, I'd be worried if I had like one of those wide brimmed hats, I'd bonk a door frame or something. So, I'm getting invaded by a kitty again. Do you want attention or not? Come here. And uh, I, I admit, I don't know how much firefighter helmets really go for, but apparently this was such a trend that everyone had to copy Teresa. In a week, it looked like every young person in the world was wearing a $10 plastic knockoff. Our genuine helmets each cost over $500. They then go to Italy, where sometimes they stayed in people's homes, making the families therein nationally famous. Teresa then gets the idea to hand the control board for the uh, columns off to Prime Minister Blair uh, in order to determine how much rain would be proper because 
The world's turning into a soaking, sopping mess, having rained for three weeks straight by this point. So some of the explosions in the North Pole have subsided, but the North Pole is still exploding. Teresa then goes to the southern part of Germany and they visit, I am not gonna get this right, Neuschwanstein? 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 castle uh, the walt disney castle apparently and i know that it's the walt disney castle because norman spends a good chunk of a paragraph talking about it and he talks about the mad king ludwig the second this this backstory would be interesting if anything became of it right now norman is just like using excess notes that he researched for this book and couldn't find a place to put in otherwise and of course, because they're in Germany, they go to Oktoberfest. And despite being a good Catholic boy, Steve had six mugs of beer, but somehow managed to stay on his feet. Teresa had two mugs as well. Uh, the book also points out that this beer had twice as much alcohol as American beer. But despite that, and despite never obviously drinking beforehand, no signs of hangover or anything for either of them. But Teresa's vacation got interrupted and she got called back to the Parker estate where she met with Prime Minister Blair and not in his office for some reason. And it's revealed that the wind is somehow coming back because apparently Hal put something in the air to affect its viscosity. It's not really explained. It, it's actually not even really relied upon later on. So it looks like Teresa maybe didn't save the world after all, but oh, Blair assures them that uh, she totally did because they would have lost like two billion people from starvation and all animals. But then comes up with another problem. With the Earth's declination being reduced to five degrees by January, the oceans will overheat, causing constant hurricanes all over the place. So Teresa has doomed the planet in another way! How badly can one person screw up? That figures, said Steve. Just when everything is going fine, we get a new problem. You have fundamentally changed how the planet's mechanics work. You don't get to say everything is fine. What am I supposed to do? I complained. Change the laws of physics? This is the most impossible problem yet. I mean, it hasn't stopped you before. So Blair asks them to return Earth's declination to its original degree. But apparently they can't do that because they'd lose most of Asia. Like, half a billion people. And Teresa, of course, is horrified at the idea of letting half a billion people die. I even wondered why God was letting this happen. How could this happen to me? I made my mistakes. And I'll bring this up now. That is the sum of how Teresa largely mentions God in this book. She'll complain about something, she'll say, oh God, why did you let this happen? And then nothing really becomes of it. God is, he's basically irrelevant. He's little better than an imaginary friend that Teresa talks to every once in a while. And I'm not saying that to be disparaging to religion, I'm saying that's how the book treats him. Poor Teresa, when her story is written, it will be said her adversary was not people in the world, but the world itself. Uh, bullshit. Teresa is her own worst enemy. She keeps causing these problems. She caused the wind. She caused the global warming. Now she's causing hurricanes. Teresa does not get pity. She is fucking up. So in order to combat the threat of these hurricanes, Steve does some thinking. And I really don't like the way that Norman approached this. We get another one of those scenes where Teresa breaks the bonds of first-person perspective narration and follows Steve around like she's there with him, but she's obviously not. Norman found a limitation within his writing style, and rather than work around it, redirect his focus, or change his perspective, he barreled through it, even though it looked disjointed and awkward. How does Teresa keep detailing these things that she's not around for? How does she know about them? Why didn't Norman just change his writing style or rewrite the scene to include Teresa working with Steve? Why didn't the event just happen in the afternoon when they would have both been awake? I can think of half a dozen reasons, uh, different ways to go around this, and Norman couldn't think of any. Instead, we just get a scene of Steve working by himself with Teresa describing everything in perfect clarity. Can't get one thing right. And the solution 
Makes no sense. What was the elemental composition of the sun? He found the answer quickly. The sun was 73.4% hydrogen and 25.0% helium. That left 1.6% of the sun made up of other stuff, and 1.6% was a lot. No, it's not. It's by definition not. It was equal to 4,000 Earths. I have no idea how you quantified that or how that's even possible to be measured, but okay. He found a list of the most abundant solar elements. The sun was 0.2% carbon. That was surprising. The sun was a dirty place. Oh, you dirty bitch, work the shaft. So it just goes on and on about the different gases and things that make up the sun. And he selects xenon uh, because Xenon is apparently four times as heavy as air, as the book puts it. And the plan now is to extract elements, raw elements, from the sun to bring them to Earth in order to offset the hurricanes. Now, I am not a meteorologist, and I'm not much of a scientist, so I cannot definitively call bullshit on this, but I'm still calling bullshit. Hi, I'm Barry. Oh my goodness gracious. I'm Dr. Bunhead and you're watching Brainiac. Oh, Barry White, eat your heart out. And if you thought that that was how stupid it was going to get, you have not been paying attention. I have a headache now. Remember your shirt, Crimson. So Teresa and Steve meet with the Prime Minister and a set of engineers, scientists, and a Royal Air Force general. And uh, Steve is uh, kind of the, the head of negotiating here. You know, he's He's the physics major, despite not having finished college. You know, I just want this group of scientists to, like, fall to their knees in front of Teresa and say, please, please stop doing literally everything you're doing. You are ruining the planet. But no, of course the scientists don't uh, use logic or plead for mercy. They're totally cool with Teresa's idea. Let, let's just bring a bunch of xenon from the sun and use that to offset hurricanes, because... That'll work! And of course, the Air Force General sees a new opportunity with this. The Royal Air Force General now spoke up. Could you also bring in helium? Steve looked puzzled. I guess. What good is it? If helium was plentiful, we could send up thousands of miniature dirigibles over territory invaded by terrorist groups. They would be lighter than air drones surveying the land for weeks at a time. We could put the terrorist organizations out of business. Oh! So you know all the advanced satellite gear, FLIR cameras, drones that we've got? Let's ignore all of that and use outdated technology that's decades old. That's, that's brilliant! If I took all the tabs out of this book, I could make a set of wings and fly away from this bullshit. What really gets me, though, is... We could put the terrorist organizations out of business. Oh, you sweet, stupid summer child. So Teresa's plan is kicked into action. She pulls a bunch of xenon from the uh, from the sun. Uh, it eventually amounts for two ounces of atmospheric pressure. So the hurricanes started to stir, but couldn't really form beyond 40 mile per hour gusts and uh, Teresa's happy about this. It was nice that I wouldn't have to kill half a billion Asians. You put that into literally any other context and it's mortifying. And then they do this stupid helium plan with the Air Force and their dirigibles. <laughs> Teresa's version of Earth is turning into something out of a fifth grader's imagination. And actually I've got a question on this. If the Air Force knows where these terrorist organizations are headquartered because you've got to set the dirigibles someplace. Why don't they have Teresa use her um, remote viewing FLIR camera vision? Because she can send that anywhere she needs to on the planet. If they have an idea of where these guys are hiding, Teresa can go in, check their caves or hotels or hideaways, anything, confirm it's them, and then the British and American governments can form a coalition and go get them. Instead, Teresa uses her powers to do things like put telescopes on the moon. 
Yes, really. And uh, this is the, the big one. Teresa decides to ruin the global economy. We get two paragraphs going into great detail about what Fort Knox is. And for those of you who don't know, Fort Knox is uh, America's uh, gold repository. We get a lot of description, uh, including the term the Yellow Stream, to describe a river of gold balls streaming towards Fort Knox, where they eventually formed a very shallow pyramid. This continued for 22 hours. I, I don't even believe it, but Norman somehow made the idea of a, a river of gold sound boring. The gold balls made a loud thump as they landed on the growing pile. They weighed about four tons apiece. In 22 hours, the last of the gold balls came down. The mountain of gold was hundreds of feet wide and much higher than the depository. It was worth trillions of dollars at current prices. I don't recall the book ever describing where this gold comes from. I'm assuming it got pulled out of space. And she does the same thing with silver, uh, only she brings that down to uh, a British army base. And Teresa sells all of this to, uh, she sells the gold to America, sells the silver to Britain, where apparently she will sell the gold at $50 an ounce and the silver at $5 an ounce. I just, there, there's so much, I, I can't process this. The benefits to nation's economies was unimaginable. I think it'd be cool if they took the $1 bill and changed it to the million dollar bill. That way nobody be poor and we'd all be millionaires. This move would be the single most disastrous thing to happen to world economies since the Depression, and would be vastly worse than the Depression. Economies are delicate things. You've got to consider a lot of different factors. In this instance, you've got to consider economic scarcity. The problem is that printing money doesn't actually give a country more money, it just makes money less valuable. So as the country printed more and more money, it became worth less and less, and the currency crashed. We can see that uh, today with Venezuela, for example, where uh, as of filming, one US dollar is equal to 248,487 uh, Venezuelan bolivars. By flooding the market with gold, because eventually this all does, does get uh, sold by the governments to the masses, so everyone's walking around. At one point, diamonds come into the equation and people are wearing diamonds in their hair, like children are wearing lots of diamonds in their hair. Because of that, you flood the market with this material to the point where it loses all of its inherent value because there's so much of it. It is not as scarce. It is not as valued. The supposed economic value that this would grant would be extremely short term. By the time it reaches the actual markets, when things have been made out of these materials and they're being sold to the public, they will be in such abundant quality that you will necessarily have to lower the price in order to sell them. That uh, heirloom gold necklace you got from your great-great-grandmother that was worth thousands of dollars? Well, I can get one just like it for 10 bucks now! And this whole exploit turns Teresa into a billionaire in the span of a month. But that's not all of it. I hired Jan Struthers as my financial manager and sent her to Kentucky to set up the gold business. First off, it's a really awkward reintroduction to bring Jan in the way that she was. Like, Teresa doesn't even directly encounter her. It's just, hey, Jan, you're on my payroll now. Go do a thing. Second, Jan has no apparent financial expertise. We, we see no examples of her understanding anything of finances or economics, and yet now she's in charge of Teresa's entire gold laundering scheme. Skill sets are not really that transferable. Just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're great at another. I like to think that I'm good at analyzing books, but I suck at drawing! Conceptually, this is the same thing as taking a drill sergeant with 20 years of experience in the army and making him a guidance counselor for elementary school students. And because no one in the book dare question Teresa or call her out on her bullshit, she just gets to sit around getting high off of her own farts. She is an unironic version of the bad guy from Bonds Beyond Time Abridged. I totally meant to do that too.
My plan is great. Also, a lot of innocent people died. Yes, there was a little collateral damage. Probably not important. My plan is great. Chapter 17, Teresa goes to court. I will say this for Norman. At least he understood that Teresa's plan was idiotic because a class action lawsuit is brought up against her because she devalued gold. So, we are filing a class action suit against Teresa Hartley for suddenly and callously ruining the fortunes of thousands of gold bullion owners. Her failure to make some kind of arrangement with the victims has led to us to ask for $35 billion in damages, which is far less than she'll get from her gold sales. And if you're curious, yes, that number is accurate. She gets way more money than that. So with this news, Teresa gets pissed off at Steve because getting the gold was apparently his idea. And the book confirms that she did not discover a gold mine on Earth. So we still don't know where she got it. So I'm assuming a passing asteroid or something, I don't know. Maybe she pulled it out of the sun. So she gets pissed off at Steve and then they have a fight and... Teresa gets consoled by Mrs. Parker in her single contribution to anything in this book. Long ago, Mr. Parker and I had our little tiffs. It was his fault, it was my fault, it was both our faults. Marriage partners share responsibility for all that follows because everything they do affects each other. All they try to do is get by in this world. When something goes wrong, they're both to blame and neither is to blame. The world is to blame. What? That was such a magnificent display of incoherent rambling that I can only picture Mrs. Parker as Banana Barber from Gumball. Your stomach produces a new layer of mucus every two weeks, otherwise it'll digest itself. A blue whale's tooth bubble is large enough to enclose a horse. No! No! <laughs> Hippopotamus milk is pink. This weird, nobody's at fault, everybody's at fault speech was enough to get Teresa to calm down and go talk to Steve. And she says, I need help. Don't worry, we'll get this lawyer, bitch. Good use of profanity there, Norman. And Teresa instantly comes up with a plan. I'm going to force her to drop the suit, I told him. I can't allow myself to be bullied. And spoilers, but her plan to stop the bullying is to do some bullying. One thing I like about superhero comics, generally speaking, is that they usually have a pretty strong moral compass. Not universally, of course, there are plenty of exceptions, but by and large, uh, Superman or Batman, for example, will agree not to kill someone or not to uh, do excess harm. The Power Rangers have a rule about never escalating fights. They have to uh, fight their opponent on even terms. Teresa is not beholden to such a moral compass. Now, sometimes you do find examples of superheroes not necessarily abiding by that, um, the moral rule set for a superhero to get away with bending their moral compass in the eyes of the reader. The author needs to show how their opponent in that moment deserves it or is something of a jerk or is so bad that certain extreme uh, circumstances need to be taken or considered. Uh, he's not exactly a superhero, but it goes to my point. Uh, in the first scene of the first Deadpool movie, Wade Wilson breaks into this guy's house and threatens him with a knife. We don't think that he's a psychopath. We find out that the pizza delivery guy that he's threatening was actually stalking um, some teenage girl, or teenager college uh, age girl. And that is such a violation of most people's moral compasses that they're like, oh, okay, you're just gonna scare him with a knife? I'm cool with that. We don't get that in Teresa. We don't, th this lawyer, that she is personally targeting is not shown to be malicious or greedy or evil. She was hired to do a job. She's a lawyer, which it's fun to make fun of lawyers because, you know, greedy, scum-sucking bastards, but she's a woman doing her job. And Teresa goes out of her way to torment this woman. For starters, a crowd of 800,000 people were crowding the courthouse where this suit was filed. So Teresa's fan club has started harassing everyone involved in this. In the one time where Teresa actually uses her remote viewing powers, she stalks this one lawyer. Her name is Connie something. Connie McKesson. She discovers she lives in a single family home. She's got like two kids. There are camera crews following her all over the place. So this is great publicity for her career. There's no mention of a husband. So I'm assuming 
She's a single mother, and Teresa sets up a separate uh, program with Hal. So as soon as Connie gets into her car... No, it's not that bad. She started the car, put the transmission in reverse, and hit the gas. The engine stalled. She tried again, pressing farther down on the gas pedal. The front drive wheels spun on the slick garage floor, throwing up smoke. But the car didn't move at all. And then she tries it again with someone else's car, like a one of the news vans offered to uh, drive her into work. And that stalled. The reality hit her. Any vehicle she entered would not move. So Teresa has created a program that targets this poor woman individually and stops any car that she attempts to get into. So all of her methods of transportation are reduced to walking and I guess biking could still work, but I don't know that for a fact. Motor vehicles are out though. The media discussed this development all day. A lawyer said, Teresa Hartley is committing a felony. Restricting someone's movements without due process is kidnapping. She could get 25 years. Ignoring for now that there's no proof that it's actually Teresa, that is a terrible definition for kidnapping. If that were true, then any time a teacher held a student late after class, they are committing kidnapping. And of course, Teresa enjoys this to the fullest. They talk about how Teresa's clearly at fault and then someone points this out. Of course, but there's not a shred of evidence. You can't go into criminal court without evidence. Anyway, who's going to arrest her? So, I could do anything I wanted to anybody and nobody would dare do anything about it. I kind of liked that. Ladies and gentlemen, the thought you just read was one of a supervillain. But it's okay, because Teresa has very unique powers, so she's not being a bad influence. I couldn't even lead by example because nobody could do what I did. The most I could do was give an example of the right attitude to have about life, God, and myself. Yeah, except that's bullshit because now we've got Teresa getting petty and vindictive and going after people who pose minor threats to her. <laughs> Powers are irrelevant in that case. The fact that she is using her powers for personal gain by damaging somebody else, hurting their means of collecting an income, that's evil. Sure, no one's being physically hurt, but you don't need to. And it's even worse because before the plan is revealed, the uh, lawyer lady, Connie, is seen hamming it up with the reporters camped outside of her house. So now she looks even more sympathetic than she did before. And of course, she wasn't working alone. There was a team of lawyers helping her out. So Teresa just targeted all of them too. I zeroed in on the Lamper building and found the eight lawyers. They were all men. So the crybaby media couldn't say I was making it hard for mommies to take care of their kids. As they said about Connie McKesson, Teresa is not present in this sentence. It does not speak of anything of her character. It speaks of authorial vitriol. Who hurt you, Norman? There is so much anger in this section that I have to assume that Norman has a personal uh, vendetta against reporters and lawyers. Like, maybe he was dating a reporter and a lawyer and they just like left him or something, and so now he just hates the entire industry? I don't know, man. Anger can be a very productive writing tool if you know how to use it, but if you mishandle it, you come off looking childish. Kind of like Teresa when she realizes that she can get away with this. The effect was electric. I could do this vehicular immobility trick with anybody and in any numbers. No one was safe. Nobody would ever dare to sue me again. The fact that she does not build a castle out of her enemy's skulls disappoints me. Teresa doesn't handle this pro this lawsuit problem in a clever method. It's not some legal outmaneuvering where she points out, oh yeah, well, according to this court case, you can't sue me because reasons. No, it's, it's little more than uh, petty bullying. Teresa put all of these lawyers and their families' welfare 
at risk. What would happen if Connie had a medical emergency and had to drive a kid to the hospital? Would her kid be okay? Would Teresa be paying attention to unlock the lawyer's car at that point so she could save her kid? I doubt it. This is a definitively evil act. Teresa is not the super good girl. Teresa is a vindictive, childish, selfish, self-serving monster. But good luck finding anyone in the book to agree with me. In fact, this idea is so revolutionary, they want to use this in order to stop terrorism. What the fuck happened to the dirigibles? An American ambassador, a guy named Ambassador Fox, swung by the Parker estate and hoped to use the grounding trick in order to put terrorists out of business. Yes, they phrased it that way again. They may hope to be martyrs and go to paradise, but there's no glamour in having to walk everywhere all your life. This is so stupid I can't quantify it. There are a great many things that Norman does not understand. He, he includes so many different subjects. And outside of the overly detailed math, he gets most of it wrong. But this is the part that annoys me the most. The idea that terrorists would give up their ways if they couldn't drive anywhere is so stupid because it does not understand terrorism or terrorists on any level. How they work, how they operate, how they, they communicate, how they get around, how they're identified, how they're defined, none of that is handled correctly. This is such a short-sighted idea because it suspects that terrorists will quit if they're slightly inconvenienced. Also, Teresa would only be able to target known or suspected ter uh, terrorists. New bad guys pop up all the goddamn time. Also, does this still work if they've renounced terrorism and they want to reform? Or if Teresa can target them so easily, why not mark the terrorists, track them down the way that she did with the lawyers, find out where the terrorists congregate, then help the authorities capture them. To get an idea of how stupid this is to get rid of terrorism, think about a hill you're willing to die on. Maybe you love free speech. Maybe you're big on trans rights. Maybe you'd wish that they would abolish man buns already. Would you abandon that battle if suddenly you were forced to walk places? No, you wouldn't. Especially in this day and age when digital access makes getting things and communicating easier than ever. Terrorists are willing to die for their beliefs. So mild inconvenience is not going to stop them. Look, if Norman really wants to play this game and he wants to come up with some way to screw with the terrorists and actually get results, he should have done this. Curse them so that really, really annoying music blared on their ears at all hours of the day. When they try to sleep, it just goes up another 10 decibels. Within a week, they'll be so sleep deprived that they won't be able to function and will ultimately die. The only way to stop the music is if they turn themselves in. And this curse could work automatically so that uh, anyone who plans to commit an act of terrorism gets cursed. And I'm not talking music is playing in their ears, it's actually in their head, therefore, uh, eventually, they don't get the relief of their eardrums exploding and canceling out the rest of the music. It's in their head, so there's no way to get around it. And that's without doing something else pragmatically, like uh, there's a red beam of light that shines down on terrorists at all times so that they glow for the authorities to locate and arrest on site. They'll still need to get a trial or something to make sure that they're not falsely accused because of Teresa's bullshit powers, but... That's a better solution than, oh, they've got to walk everywhere. Bitch, if that were true, no terrorist organization would be able to form in the third world. Teresa even compares this to crossing the Rubicon, meaning by getting involved in international politics, she won't be able to go back to her normal way of life. And I say bullshit because what's stopping her? from doing this one favor and then never getting involved again. This does not seem like a definitive divulgent path where she has to just keep hunting terrorists, which is not the worst fate I can think of. But ultimately she agrees to annoy the terrorists into submission. And because of this book was written by a fruit bat, it works. The Parkers expressed some concern for Teresa because getting involved in this 
scenario is dangerous for Teresa. The Parkers made no effort to hide their disappointment. Their darling Teresa was more important to them than nameless bombing victims. That was one of the most callous, heartless things this book has to offer. I get what Norman's going for, but oh my god, you could have phrased that so much better. Sad as the situation was, Teresa's safety meant more to the Parkers than anything else. There. Easy. I came up with that in like five seconds. Also, where are Teresa's parents in this? She's been living with the Parkers for months. Are they just her surrogate parents now? She's a US citizen and has made no effort to go back. And Norman doesn't know how black ops work. If this leads to war, I want the president to take responsibility. I want it in writing with her signature this week. And the, the president, uh, Stinson, is dumb enough to actually go through with that. If something like this were to occur, it would likely be a black op mission. Think Mitch Rep, um, American Assassin. They just came out with that like last year, I think it was two years ago. Or Jason Bourne, Th those are black ops missions. The last thing anyone is going to do in a scenario like that is have a paper trail directly admitting to participation <laughs> this, this is so dumb. Chapter 18. See, that's the other thing. These, these vignettes are brought in so weirdly. Like, the lawsuit thing was dropped, then this terrorist thing was brought up in the same chapter, and now we're continuing with it in another chapter. Like, why couldn't this have been its own chapter? And this whole thing is actually finished off in three and a half pages, so there, there's no reason to format your book like this, because then another plot point is brought up, and that carries through for the rest of the chapter. Why is this written like this? We also get this horrifying implication as Teresa points out that she did have a backup plan in case one of the lawyers needed an ambulance. The lawyers might have tried to trick me by saying they needed an ambulance. I'd need to look at the person quickly to see if they really needed an ambulance. Then, if I did turn off the grounding and turned it on again, I'd have to look at the person to make sure he wasn't in an airplane. Oh boy, what would happen then? Hal would stop the plane instantly. The passengers would be crushed like applesauce. I'd be less annoyed if someone actually reacted properly in the book. Teresa kind of just does the job half-heartedly and then leaves the rest of it to the American government. I, I really, I can't phrase it any better than that. Like, they mark terrorists and I guess they got bombed? The whole thing kind of disrupts itself as Teresa goes off on a tangent talking about how she's using silver now. And silver is apparently so prevalent that President Stinson is developing silver coins in 20 cents, $1, and $5 denominations with Teresa's pictures on them in numbers too huge to be absorbed into the American economy. In an act of undue humility. And then Teresa ends the thing by, do you remember her uh, boyfriend from college, Jack? She ends by, by asking Teresa calling Jack, how are you doing with Ginny? And she actually ended another section previously like that. I wondered what my old BC boyfriend, Jack Coster was thinking of all this. You're married, who cares? But anyway, the terrorist thing, Done for, because now we get, I'm just gonna speed through this because this section's boring as hell, but we get this new group called OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And if that sounds like Norman being incredibly uncreative, don't worry, it's actually not his fault. That is a real group. So President Stinson uh, flies to England to warn Teresa about OPEC and what they might be planning. OPEC ultimately wants to go after Teresa because she's a threat to their bottom line. Yeah, well, Steve and I have a plan that will take care of them. The sun has lots of carbon. We're going to bring trillions of tons of it to Earth. It can be used to generate electricity at very low cost. Everybody will switch to electric cars. Driving will be almost free. I don't even need to touch that one. President Stinson admits at one point that she doesn't know what OPEC is planning, but apparently they think they can make you cave in and turn you into a slave. Now, the thing that's really boring is Teresa never encounters these OPEC guys in any meaningful capacity. She never confronts them. She never talks to them face to face. She never even gets so much as a phone call. The closest we get 
of any interaction, frankly, of any character of these OPEC guys is their secretary general, Khaled bin Azad, who gets on the TV and lists his demands. We seek justice on the world stage. If it is not given to us, we will take it. We demand the operation known as grounding be removed from all freedom fighters. The phrase freedom fighters was his term for the murderous terrorists. We demand that Teresa Hartley put $10 billion every month into a fund for the world's poor. We demand the land known, as, uh, known to the West as Israel be returned to the people who lived there before 1947. If these demands are not met, we will sell no oil to the United States or the European Union. And uh, that is a list of problems that I am not going to get into. I'll just point out that Teresa's overabundant gold and silver has flowed to other third world countries, so she is helping the world's poor, at least in her eyes, and as, as declared by the book. So Teresa does what she does best. A little of the competition. She decides to compete with OPEC directly and creates what I will later be referring to as Oil Island. However, she first has to find oil, and you'll need to forgive me, but I'm going to read this singular paragraph to give you an idea of how astonishingly boring this is. I haven't done that this review yet. Let's just see how long it can last. He turns to plate tectonics. Soon he found something startling. Antarctica was originally connected to Africa right next to Madagascar. Antarctica drifted south and was just beginning to cross the South Pole. The Antarctic coastline on the Atlantic side with the tip of Africa pointed right at the middle was the part of Antarctica that had once been joined to Africa just below where Madagascar had been similarly attached. The coastline of that section of Antarctica still matched the African coastline from which it moved. The two continents were separated by a distance equal to the width of Antarctica, which was a lot of room to play in, except for one tiny uninhabited ice-covered island called Beauvais Island, belonging to Norway. There wasn't a single square foot of land in this immense expanse of ocean. I, I give up. That's, that's as far as I can reread. There's like another ten lines in that paragraph. And for some reason, while all this is going on, the Prime Minister of Israel a Benjamin Scherzer? I guess that's correct. I'm just gonna go with Prime Minister Ben, which could be a very not at all clever connection to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, but I can't say for sure. So at the same time of Teresa doing all this bullshit with Oil Island, I guess Israel is being threatened by OPEC. Prime Minister Ben asks Teresa to save Israel, to Stop it, because it's it, Israel's surrounded by enemies, as the book phrases it. And the terrorists are still a threat, I guess, so Teresa's grounding plan probably wasn't that great at all. I don't know, I, I'm... I can barely follow this book. I don't think anyone can properly follow this book. But, um... Yeah, this is, uh... This section's interesting. Get ready for the most racist bullshit in this book! So Teresa thinks it over and comes up with two plans to save Israel. Plan A is moving Israel, which is a feat that we've seen her do multiple times before. This would be on a larger scale, but narrative convenience, I'm sure she could do it. But that plan gets rejected. What's plan B? Steve smiled. I knew you wouldn't like plan A. Plan B is, Teresa can raise an island for you out of the ocean floor. He pulled out a crude drawing of an island. It was in the shape of the Star of David. Ugh. <sighs> Yeah, that's in this book. That's a real thing. My condolences to anyone of Jewish descent for that blatant disrespect. But wait, did you think that was all the racism? Because it's not. It's never just the one thing. It's always compounded. God damn it, Norman. The problem with this plan is it will be months before it's habitable. You may have to put up somewhere. Maybe your friends in New York and Florida can take you in. I spent money on this book. What is my life? Fortunately, that Star of David Island plan gets rejected and, and Prime Minister Ben makes his own and Teresa goes with that design. Now, Teresa is able to raise the island easily enough and Prime Minister Ben is able to lead 
a, a group, a migration out of the country, an exodus, one may call it. He goes on for like four pages describing what this new island is going to be, and he could have done it in like two paragraphs. And this is handled in the dumbest way, not because it's impractical, insensitive, a little racist, and is a clear attempt at replicating one of the more famous moments from the Bible, uh, Moses parting the Red Sea. Forgive me, I'm getting ahead of myself. So you remember the first cover I showed, the, the, the original cover for Empress Teresa, and you had that weird thing in the upper corner that kind of looked like a bad canyon or suspension bridge. Well, I believe that's supposed to be what I will be calling the mud bridge because the Exodus plan is to not to get everyone in Israel on a plane or on a car and have them leave that way. The plan is to create a bridge out of mud, to raise it from the bottom of the Mediterranean and have people walk across it from Israel to Crete, a distance of about 400 miles. But wait! What about the assassins? Literally nobody asked. Well, Teresa's got that covered. She will be creating these gigantic reverse waterfalls that shoot out from the Mediterranean and splash upwards, not, not going over the mud bridge, but uh, protecting all of the people on the mud bridge from one end to the other. They go up about 100 feet into the air, if I remember correctly, where assassins will not be able to um, jump into the sides or attack from the sides or from the sea or from boats. But wait, again, literally nobody asked, what about assassins sneaking in through the dark? Well, don't worry, it doesn't happen in this chapter, but Teresa does have a solution for that. And yes, it does ruin the planet. We've got a, instead of a quick miracle, uh, displaying God's power and his devotion to his people in one of the one of the more memorable moments from the Bible. You've got Teresa doing a bad job replicating the the whole event, but without any substance and without acting as an agent of God. The, the entire thing is just this really insensitive farce, like a blatant copy-paste job. And if that wasn't stupid enough, Teresa tells no one about this plan. Prime Minister Ben knows, and I'm pretty sure Prime Minister Blair knows, but uh, anyone living on Crete? They don't know until it happens. So not only do they have all that bullshit to put up with for as long as the mud bridge is active, but all of a sudden they have to account for the entire population, just about the entire population of Israel, suddenly becoming roommates with them. I mean, yeah, the Israelis uh, leave Crete soon enough, but y you can't just accommodate a population of however millions of people that is all at once. Also, is supposed to be capable of stopping people and, and stopping terrorists by mildly inconveniencing them. Why can't she do that with with Israel's enemies. Was Mormon so dead set on recreating the crossing of the, the Red Sea that he had to forego his own logic to make it happen? If that's the case, why have the earlier scene of her combating terrorists? There is no logic in this book. At the same time, Teresa discusses undercutting OPEC by selling oil at about $20 a barrel, because fuck those guys. The 24-hour uh, thing might actually be a, a second reference to the Bible with, um, what was it, the Battle of Joshua versus uh, Hezekiah, in which God did exactly that, created a 24-hour day in order to assist Joshua in battle. However, this clearly forgets that Teresa screwed up the axis of the planet, among many other disastrous miracles, so providing 24-hour sunlight does not seem that far-fetched from what she is capable of doing, even though she claims, I would have to be God to do that. And the solution's really not that impressive. Chapter 19, almost done with this. So we can add Prime Minister Ben to Teresa's exhaustive list of cheerleaders. Those who challenge Teresa Hartley's power are fools. She could destroy the world. 
Don't push her too far. What do you mean could destroy the world? And the book uncomfortably goes back and forth between this Exodus plotline and this oil plot line. I think Norman intended them to kind of intertwine and go back and forth and kind of work hand in hand, but they're handled so haphazardly that they feel like entirely separate threads. They, they don't really mesh very well. So we'll get this clunky exposition of what's going on with Israel and then clunky exposition of what's going on with this oil deal. So Teresa's plan is to create a new island, not just for the Israelis, but a separate one for uh, creating oil and, and generating oil at uh, large quantities so she can properly challenge OPEC in their territory. The problem is the setup is so confusing that I don't know what happens. Teresa starts moving things, uh, moving rocks and ice around Antarctica, and we get this. Along the southwestern corner of the rectangle, where the line I had drawn began, the ice went straight up at 200 miles an hour. Yes, hours. This 10 mile wide curtain of ice went merrily down the line I had drawn at 20 miles an hour. The first plane to reach this activity went down into the channel, as it was soon called, and noted that the bottom was a perfectly flat table of rock 1,000 feet below sea level. The channel was already 60 miles long when this information was passed to the world. It was clear I was ripping up a lot of rock along with the ice to keep the channel bottom below sea level. Now, because Teresa, like so many other times, does not actually explain what her plans are, some people are starting to panic. Norman sets this up so that he doesn't have to ruin the surprise for the reader, but this is very easily solved by saying that Teresa explained the plan to various people in charge while not explaining what it actually is to the reader. You can, in fact, do both at the same time. We also get a slew of stupid lines, and apparently within hours people demonstrated in the streets all over the world. Has Teresa gone insane? Destroying land like that? What had changed? Nothing I had done until then damaged land. You know, if you ignore the whole stopping the wind thing, and the North Pole exploding, and all of the barriers for the North Pole, and sogifying the planet, and tilting the Earth so that you cooked people, and single-handedly ensuring global warming. But yeah, you know, other than that, absolutely nothing. How quickly people forgot my benevolence when fear took control of them. In other words, the worldwide panic is just a plot contrivance. Teresa tries to defend not warning anybody of anything that she's doing, and gives the dumbest reason for it. I can't tell you what I'm doing. People will get in the way and get themselves killed. Yeah, it seems like if you warn them, they'll be able to avoid certain things. Otherwise, the ground might rip up from underneath them. Also, what's changed? You've warned people before. And apparently, this creates such a panic that the Prime Minister orders soldiers and anti-aircraft weapons moved up to the Parker Estate. Reading this book is like some insane punishment that some madman inflicted upon me. Some of these weapons that the British soldiers are using include Gatling guns. Admittedly, this is a nitpick, but I found it kind of amusing. Norman uses Gatling gun as if it's a specific uh, type of weapon but a Gatling gun is actually a model, and one onto its own. I admit I don't know what Britain's standard arsenal is, but in America, the Gatling gun was declared obsolete in 1911. So I'm not sure why Britain would be using technology that is a century out of date. I think what Norman wanted to say was minigun. Gatling guns have been out of fashion for a while. This just takes so long to get anywhere. It, part of the reason this is so difficult to read is because it just goes on and on and on with all this detail that could be summed up in a couple of sentences. Short version from what I can regather going over this again is Teresa creates a gigantic ice curtain about 20 miles tall. I don't actually remember what any of this was for. Like there's, there's some sort of a rectangle inside this curtain in Antarctica that Teresa is manipulating and this is necessary to the creation of the oil island. I think it's about displacement. Uh, President Stinson comes on and uh, addresses the nation at four in the morning, because, you know, 
That's a great time to address the nation. She was really saying, shut the hell up about Teresa. We don't want to get her upset. Let her forget about us. So Teresa inspires fear among world leaders again. We went to bed. Prime Minister Blair called Edmund Parker to ask if he could visit in the morning. And of course, Parker said yes. The soldiers and their weapons were withdrawn from the Parker house during the night. Nobody apologized to me. Oh, you poor thing. You terrified the planet and no one said sorry to you. Oh, it's so awful being Teresa. Now, you remember how Teresa ruined gold and silver and made them worthless? Well, here's the good news. Teresa has been working on bringing a large amount of carbon to Earth. We decided that it's not needed for electric power. We think a new island will give us all the energy we need. Teresa changed the program. The carbon she's isolating is close to the sun's heavy gravity, and it's around 8,000 degrees. The gravity there is 22 times what we feel on Earth. It occurred to us that if Teresa stretched out this mass of carbon to a cylinder 100 miles high, the pressure at the bottom will be way over a million pounds per square inch. The carbon will turn to diamond. If it works, Teresa will throw a ring of diamonds in orbit and give the Israelis 24-hour daylight. That is amazing. And not in the way that Norman wants me to say that. And of course, she has excess diamonds which are sent to Earth. And the beneficiaries of the diamond trade will be England and Israel, at least for the first couple of minutes, when diamonds still have some kind of artificial value. Teresa then jumps topics and goes back to saving Israel. Blair points out that uh, when the mud bridge is raised, it'll be difficult for cars to drive across and it's difficult for people to walk across it. So he asks if Teresa could raise the bridge to give the mud time to dry out and harden. Sure, I can do it in three weeks. Soon enough? Yes, it will take Israel's enemies longer to prepare an attack. We detect no preparations. The absolute balls of this man to pretend to have the slightest fucking idea of what he's talking about. And despite all this preparation, all this planning behind the scenes, Prime Minister Ben still hasn't addressed his nation. The Israeli people must be prepared for an evacuation if one is necessary. It's not something people can adjust to in one day. Imagine an evacuation is needed and the people panic at the idea. They need time to think about it. Also, the Prime Minister needs to see if the Israelis are willing to move. You have made all this preparation ahead of time, done all this work with Teresa, who's made all these programs and all these plans, and Prime Minister Ben hasn't even talked to the Jewish people about abandoning their ancestral homeland. What the fuck? Norman is so eager to replicate random scenes from the Bible that he doesn't even consider the cultural implications that he is proposing. It doesn't matter that this is, I'm assuming, grossly offensive to anyone of Jewish descent or anyone who lives in Israel. It doesn't matter that it is a tasteless carbon copy of an early scene from Norman's favorite book. I'm not even out here trying to ruin the guy. I, I'm just like, Norman, what the fuck were you thinking? I mean, if you understood anything about the Bible, you'd, you'd think you'd have some understanding of the cultural importance of Jerusalem. Fuck, man. What else is there to really say? The Oil Island finishes. It is a an instant financial success. Teresa sells oil at $20 a barrel, and uh, OPEC is all but ruined financially. And apparently it is extremely prosperous for Teresa. The foreman of the team said, if the whole island is like this, we have oil for a thousand years. And uh, this meant a lot of good news for Teresa, who could probably afford to buy the planet at this point. There's an expression in the rich people's circles. What are you worth on paper? On paper, I was a multi-trillionaire. I was still 18. So Teresa has become the richest person in history, using her powers almost exclusively for personal gain, while claiming humility and sacrifice under a completely false pretense. Oh, but what about those OPEC guys who 
were barely a threat and barely a blip within the larger scheme of this entire book, and I don't believe show up for the rest of the story. Well, as for OPEC, Steve and Parker were watching me innocently hand-feeding my innocent chi Jesus Christ, don't use two words in the same sentence like that. My innocent little chipmunks when Steve told Parker they tried to blackmail something out of Teresa. They're guilty of criminal stupidity. It's their fault they're going to lose everything. It's incredible how stupid people are. This author in a nutshell, that's it. I cannot take any more of this for the moment. I am cutting it off right here. We are on page 306 now. That is the end of chapter 19. We have eight chapters to go. Maybe I can do this in one more part, maybe two more, we'll have to see. I'm gonna try to wrap it up in one more review, but Therese is gonna have to contend with her most dangerous opponents yet. Actual terrorists who actually show up, North Korea again, and Hal himself.